Are you ready? ready? Let's go. Welcome, welcome to an all new season of Sonya On Air, where the big OGs are connected to the little OGs. I'm so excited to be back in the studio. Did you miss me? I know you did, because sometimes I miss myself. <laughs> this is an all new season, an exciting season of Sonya On Air. Dope content but all new celebrity interviews. I just want to give a huge shout out to my new home, as you can see, S Street Media, who's welcomed Sonya on air with open arms. Now be sure to subscribe to Sonya on air streaming platforms on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, iHeart Podcasts, and YouTube for all of my celebrity dope interviews. Now, starting off this new season, I have two amazing celebrity interviews. But you know what? Sometimes in live podcasting, live radio, guess what happens? <laughs> Guests are late. So joining me later on in the show, I have none other than Grammy nominated rap icon, Yo-Yo. I know you remember Yo-Yo. This is where the big OGs have to connect to the little OGs. You can't play with my Yo-Yo. yo Yo, don't try to play me out. Don't try to play me out. Who doesn't remember that song? But joining me in just a few moments, he said he's five minutes away. I just got the text. So he's going to be jumping right on into this live show. I have Marquan Smith. Now, this is what's so amazing. You know, just dealing with whole this all new celebrity space and entertainment, radio, television, film. What we're finding out in this whole space of melanin dopeness, we're always trying to create this new space, trying to put seats at the table, trying to break down doors to enter into the room. Well, Marquand has done this because he is the executive producer of The Godfather of Harlem. I don't know if you've seen this docu-series on Epics. I don't even have Epics if it wasn't for this all this all new docu-series. It's so amazing. It explores the life of mob gangster, drug dealer, Bumpy Johnson. But the connection that they're making is the connection between crime life and the civil rights movement. You'll see Malcolm X in this docu-series. So it just really gave me a different optics on the life of Bumpy Johnson growing up in, in Harlem. I'm from New York City. Shout out to all you know people from New York City, especially from Brooklyn, because we do it different in Brooklyn. But you have to get this series. Now, I'm not going to tell you how I got Epics, <laughs> because I don't have it a part of my uh, cable subscription, but I do have my Fire Stick. Shout out to all the people <laughs> who watch all of the new movies, all of these um, cable shows on Fire Stick. But I'm telling you, Please, please, please make sure that you catch up on The Godfather of Harlem. The season is over. And when he joins us, I'm hoping that he is going to give us the great news that has been renewed for a season two. This content, I'm telling you, this is what we need to see. It gave me everything that I needed. It came on every Sunday. And I'm telling you, the first thing that I did every Sunday, well, first of all, you know, I praise God because I wasn't, you know, always making it to church. So, you know, I wanted to make sure that I got Jesus in my life. <laughs> but then after that, I made sure that I watched The Godfather of Harlem. And I didn't even do it by myself. Once again, Sonia Onair, you know, the celebrity brand, but also the mother that I am, I wanted to connect the big OGs, to the little OGs. So I made sure that my daughter, who's 24, sat down with me every single Sunday to watch The Godfather of Harlem. And we kind of dissected what we saw, what we heard. We did some research. We had conversations. This is what you need to do. This is how you connect the big OGs to the little OGs. But then just, you know, infusing yo-yo into this, this conversation when I tell you I am such a fan, every celebrity that I will bring to you on Sonya on air, I'm a huge fan. So I'm sure the questions that I will ask, you'll be asking as well. So do me a favor. Whenever you 
go to my social media pages. Make sure that you follow me on Instagram at Sonya on air. That's S A N Y A O N A I R. For those of you who had a public school education like me, you know, I got to spell it out for some folks. <laughs> it's because some people really don't even know how to spell Sonya, and that's okay. It's perfectly fine. But I'm a fan of every single celebrity that I bring to you here on Sonya on Air. So when you follow me on Instagram and you notice that I have a celebrity guest that you're a fan of, why don't you do me a favor, DM me. Don't DM me asking me to go out on a date, which some of you do. I'm not here for that. But you know, you can ask me to ask your questions and I'll do that for you live on the show. Not every question may not make it live on air, you know, because some questions may not be uh, a question that I want to ask. Some questions are a little bit inappropriate, you know, so we're going to keep it cute. We're going to keep it sexy, but don't be afraid to ask those questions because I want to make sure that my guests can feel you through these streaming platforms as well. But I'm a huge fan of Yo-Yo and she has a new song out. It's called Out of Control. I love it. I'm always out of control when I'm listening to the song. Not even when I'm listening to the song. I'm a little bit out of control. My daughter sometimes has to kind of bring me down. You know, she gives me the dose of calmness <laughs> that I need because sometimes my energy is really all over the place. Now, let's see. Marquan is here. He just asked what room we're in. So my engineer is going to run out, grab him real quick and bring him in because I'm really excited to ask him all of these questions. And I want to make sure that I have room in this one hour episode to ask him all of these questions that's really been on my mind since I watched the episode. This is what this is, you know, what I want to tell all of you, just some words of advice. Put it out there in the universe. Put it out there in the universe, whatever you want, because When I watched the first episode, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to have him on the show. And if it wasn't for a friendly connection, you know, shout out to my homeboy Attica. I mean, he's also Emmy nominated on the Trayvon Martin story, Rise in Power. They're friends in the whole acting world, this this industry. And he made the connection. So that's another word of advice. You know, just expand your network because it makes the work so much easier for you to do. Hi, Marquand. Hey. Come on over. Come on. You're just going to have a seat. You're just going to jump right into this interview. <laughs> How are you? Have a seat. Come on. Come on. Let me, let me, let me give you some, a little hug, a little hug. Sorry, there's a lot of traffic. I'm sorry. I understand. New York City, traffic. What can you do? You're going to come right here. You're going to, this is your microphone. All right. I think we had headphones. For Mark Juan? Did I? Got the wrong headphones, Mark Juan. So, you know, this is the start of my whole new season, right? Oh, really? The first show. Congratulations. Seven years. Congratulations. Can I get a little high five? Absolutely. You know, a little black love, black support. This is what we do here for, you know, for the people. Absolutely. I'm so excited to really have a conversation. I like your outfit, by the way. I get distracted by fashion. <laughs> you can tell you're from New York, yeah. Harlem, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, okay. Now, I know sometimes with us and, you know, black folks, I read your name really isn't Marquand, right? No, it's really, it's Mark Anthony Smith. Um, I was uh, given that name Marquand from my older brother, uh, father, Father MC. Um, uh... They used to call me Mark the Don, then it became Marquand the Don because women were attracted to me a lot when I was young. Oh, you was, was a little sexy? Yeah. A little sexy thing, you? You still you, you still bit, sexy? You, know I mean? you got that sexy sauce? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got that sweet and sour sauce. Ah, <laughs> not the sweet and sour That's sauce. We're going to need five of those from the time. Because, <laughs> you know, sometimes they try to give you one. <laughs> but, you know, you just said something. I just want to, you know, let that resonate in the, in the universe. Because as I was interviewing, um, well, not interviewing, researching yeah. who you are, I didn't even realize that you're old. Older brother yeah. is Father MC. I just got off the phone with him, actually. Are yeah. you serious? Yeah. So this is what I want to do, you know, real quick, because I danced so much to Father MC. Are you serious? What? Come on, I'm from New York. I'm from Brooklyn. So this is what we do. You know, great music. But this show connects the big OGs to little OGs. Yeah. So I just want to play a little snippet of one of my favorite Father MC songs. So can we just do that real quick? Can we drop that real quick, please? Wow, 
Ah! <laughs> Let's just get that rolling. You know, for the little OGs who really don't even have a clue. We got that together? We working on it. We working on it. You hear it? You hear it? Come on, come on, come on. Why yeah. girls play with my feelings? I don't know, so, so that's, that's what I ask. <laughs> Maybe it's true that I set myself <laughs> what? up. But then again, it's the question hey, I ask. Two steps, I want someone two steps. for me who hey. is straight. A kind of cutie, yes, yep, a smart me. Mm. I've been around searching for the right one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know the word. You know what's so crazy? What? Uh, that you that, that uh, BET is actually doing a mini series on Uptown Records. Really? Yeah, they had a big casting call yesterday, and um, that's right. Yeah. In in Newark. Yeah, in Jersey. Yes. 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 And Andre flew out there. I think he's back in L.A. right now. But uh -huh. I, I'm I'm so glad because um, it's like I don't want anybody to write my brother out of history right. because he was there. Yes. In the beginning. Yes. Um, he's he's helped uh, a lot of uh, artists on his platform, such as Mary J. Blige and Jodeci and uh, Intro. Mm -hmm. You know, we we work with the great greatest producers like Eddie F. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Soul Convention, Corey Rooney and and, and Marky D. You know, so wow. So he's going to be a part of that. Yeah, Herbie Love, that show. Love, all these guys. You know, I I hope I, I I'm not part of that production, but I'm hoping okay. that they. You know, they do what's right. You they know, include like, him. Yeah. So what is he up to now? I'm sure people want to oh, know. He's, he's living in Tarzana, California. He's relaxing. He's He has he's, kids? Uh, yeah, he has, he, has, he has children. He's out there planting tomatoes. And, you know, all kinds <laughs> I of do stuff. that too. So. You know, like, <laughs> he, he's not this, in the limelight as much, but he's still right. loves the music. He's right. still, he's still uh, producing and trying to help people. With That's dope. Yep. That's dope. But, you know, that really defined an era, especially in New York City, yeah. of... Sex, money, drugs, and violence, and it's violence, and especially for us, sometimes it's hard to escape those those genres. Yep. But you've done it now. Yep. Escaping that, what was your first taste of success in this whole kind of industry, entertainment I, industry? I'll be honest with you, I um, I came up in Harlem, 128th and Saint Nicholas. Okay. And then I was mo I moved out to Far Rockaway, Queens. Yeah. And if you know about Far Rockaway, the, it's the last stop on the A train, uh -huh. you don't want to fall asleep. You don't. <laughs> Um, they don't even consider themselves part of Queens. You feel what I'm saying? It's just Far Rockaway is Far Rockaway, right? Okay. And what I did to do, like, you know, I was a knucklehead. You know, I've been through the DFY system. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in Spofford. I've done a lot of craziness, like, you know, that I look back on my life, you know. And I read a book called Man, Child, in the Promised Land, which was mm. one of my favorite books that in order for me to go come home in a home pass or what's called a furlough, I had to read that book. Mm -hmm. So they I, made you read that book, or you yeah, just no, you knew no, you had that, to. That was something my counselor uh, referred me or recommended me to read, and okay. that, and that's why my love for reading was so much. And when I came back home, how to escape uh, what was going on around me, like you know gunshots and and all kinds of violence, was I would lock myself in a room, mm -hmm. and I watch I would watch movies. So I would watch like Rebel Without a Cause. Uh, on these mean streets, on the, uh, the waterfront, Raging Bull, mm -hmm. you know, and I started to actually soak in different directors like Martin Scorsese, Sergio Leone. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite movies is Once Upon a Time in America. And mm -hmm. um, it was just a bunch of stuff I used to soak in. And that started, that initiated the, cre uh, the creating process of me, being a creator. And my brother, father used to work at Kentucky Fried Chicken. So they used to call him the Flower Man. Really? But... He never hustled. That wasn't that wasn't our thing, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm I've been around hustlers, and I hustled, but he never did that. Okay. And he used to tell people, "I'm gonna be a rapper. I'm gonna be a rapper." Nobody believed. And, him. and nobody believed him. Mm -hmm. But we used to we used to hop the train to go to, to the go to the new music seminar mm -hmm. in, in the city to promote his music. We used to do all kinds of things just you know to get there, come back, share Chinese food together, and. And and drink a forty ounce of beer and just right. just talk about though this is we're we're, we're trying to escape this madness and then you know he he linked up with Andre he got his deal uh, five months later you see his video on Video Music Box treating like they want to be treated wow and it all changed you know wow. and one thing about my brother he was 
he worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken, but he was the flyest dude I knew. Like he had every color ballys, mm -hmm. silk shirts. You would never knew that he had a, uh, you know, he was a chicken man. Like, right, he worked at the, the flower man, like you yeah, said. Yeah, the, the flower <laughs> man. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, those little things like that just helped me elevate, and I was able to travel the world with him. And mm -hmm. you know, I've been to Africa. I've been uh, my first tour was with Tony, 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 Candyman, Troop, High Five. Oh wow! Um, second to none, AMG and. A certain a certain artists I'm still cool with to this day, like Raphael Sadiq, that's my big brother, like okay. Money B from uh, Digital Underground, because I was a roadie for my brother. Okay. So um, so it was Tupac. Pac was a roadie for um for Digital Underground. Treacher was a roadie for Latifah. Mm -hmm. And for your listeners that don't know what a roadie does, a roadie does all the grunt work. Like, I was carrying coffins. I was make. we didn't have dat tapes or or Serratos and then I had we had big twelve hundred turntables mm -hmm. that I had to carry to make sure uh it was good on the bus and I had to break down stuff all by myself but it it just enlightened me to, you know, hard work. So, right. you know I'm sure it made and you plus, humble yeah, yeah and plus I, I got to see uh different individuals meet different people and travel the world. Mm -hmm. And the most beautiful thing is being on a tour bus and you actually see seeing the country just go by and you just like it gives you a, a thought process of like, no, I don't, I'm not going back to where I left. I'm going to keep right. striving to, to do what I want to do. Wow, that's an amazing story. And what I really loved about one piece of that story, your counselor had you read that book. Yeah. Pivotal moments. Yeah. You know, and unfortunately, some of us don't make it out of, you know, those yeah. types of communities. Yeah. And I'm glad that your story is a testimony. Yeah. Because there's someone listening and watching this yeah. live stream saying, you know what? I may be in this current circumstance, yeah. but it doesn't mean that that's going to be my destination. No, nah, that doesn't, you know, we, we, your, your environment doesn't subject you to the rest of your life. You, yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? Um, I was always an individual. I didn't, I never had a plan B. Because I say, when you have a plan B, you're planning to fail. Mm -hmm. So why have a plan B? Stick to your plan A. Why I was like, oh, I'm, if I don't be a doctor, then I'm going to just work for the city. Mm -hmm. Then you not you don't really believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. Plan A's don't always come with money or or, or, or or success or fame, you know. But if you stick to your goal, eventually, you know, that's just the universe. That's just right. karma. It's right. going to come back to you. You know what I'm saying? If you, if you work out and you keep working out... Mm -hmm. Eventually, you're going to get the body that you want, to, but so you got to you got to keep doing that. You mm -hmm. can't just say, "Well, I'm not going to work out today, and I'm going to just go just relax." And not, you know what I'm saying? So I, I've always believed in having a plan, uh, plan A, not plan a plan a. B. Yeah, I love that. But you know, let's fast forward this a little bit because I'm so impressed. Yeah. And blessings to you, yep. um, executive producer yep. of The Godfather of Harlem on Epics. Thank you. I watched every single episode. And before you entered into um, this room, I was just telling my listeners, the second thing that I did every uh, Sunday morning, because the yeah. first thing was I prayed, because sometimes I was a he I'm a heathen, I don't yeah. go to church. Yeah. But I made sure that I watched it, not only with myself, but with my daughter. Oh, wow. That's... And we would have conversations. My daughter's in the next room. That's beautiful. You know, because once again, connecting the big OGs to the little OGs. Yeah. So tell me, because we're always talking about, you know, Melanin Magic getting a seat at the table. And you're in the room. Yeah. How did you make that happen where you became the executive producer? Well, the story goes like this. Um, Margaret Johnson is like my godmother. Mm -hmm. And Margaret is played by an actress by the name of Demi Singleton. So just clarify, so Margaret Johnson is... Bumpy, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. Okay. Margaret Johnson is Bumpy Johnson's granddaughter. Okay. okay? okay. But he raised her like that was his daughter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from internal family conflicts or whatever was going on. And I used to go to Lennox Terrace uh, 18 years ago, mm -hmm. and I would hang out with Margaret. And... I would just go check on her and make sure she was okay because she was an older lady living there and she didn't have a nurse. She's fiercely independent. You know, mm -hmm. I've never saw any family members come around. And I was mm -hmm. introduced to her through my cousin. His, his name is Tony Dunlop, and his mother was Margaret's best friend. Okay. So I would go there, and Margaret took a liking to me where I became her godson. Mm -hmm. And she would tell me these magical stories about Harlem. She'll be like, you know, how she used to walk down 125th Street and see James Brown's name on the marquee mm. or walk down the street and smell fresh linen coming out of a tenement window. And uh, 
hear Sam Cooke's voice coming out of Transistor Radio wow. or walking past um, Sugar Ray Robinson's barbershop mm-hmm. and seeing Nat King Cole getting a haircut. Mm-hmm. And I was I used to be so, so mesmerized just sitting there for hours. It was like a, a history story being told to me, but she also yeah. told me about her, um, her grandfather, who's uh, Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson. Mm-hmm. So Ellsworth Raymond Bumpy, uh, Ellsworth Raymond Johnson, everybody knows as Bumpy, came up here from... Uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. He was a Geechee. Mm -hmm. And he came up here to basically find the American dream like every immigrant has. You Mm -hmm. feel what I'm saying? Because we are all immigrants. You know what I mean? And uh, he wanted to become an attorney like Malcolm X did. Mm -hmm. But the bursar said, you know what? We don't give financial aid to colored folks. Mm -hmm. So he said, you know what? I'm going to make you regret what you just told me. Mm -hmm. And he took what he had by any means necessary right. to go out there and make it happen. But Bumpy wasn't just a gangster. He also read Nietzsche. He read Shakespeare. He was a he was an avid historian. He was a, a fighter for 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 black policy. Mm-hmm. But he was also a gangster. Mm-hmm. And this show was not about you know she wanted to just to show the real the real truth about who her her grandfather was. Not the American gangster. No, Bumpy didn't die in front of 30 RCA TVs with mm-hmm. Frank Lucas sitting behind him like an American gangster. That's Hollywood fiction. Mm-hmm. Bumpy died of congestive heart failure okay. eating dinner in my character's arms, right? Mm-hmm. Bumpy, uh, even though he was a gangster, he he was the first African American that could sit down with the mob, like the Maya Lanskys, the right. Bugsy Siegels, the Frank Costellos, the... Uh, the Vito Genovese, they all knew him because mm-hmm. he was he was born in 1905, so he's part of that old old country, that old gangsterism. You feel right. what I'm saying? And they liked him because he was an uh, a, a savage. He was a philosopher, and they were able to use him as a vessel. You know, mm-hmm. so I'm not trying to tell your audience that. I'm telling you all the good things about him, right. but he also was a dope dealer. You know right. what I'm saying? He was all he, he also destroy the community, right? So this show is about the redemption of an older man coming home from Alcatraz in 1963 Harlem Mm -hmm. and how he tried to change from what he was. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I tell people all the time, so what, you you sent a a thousand kids in the neighborhood to Great Adventure or you bought a a hundred book bags to back to school or you gave out turkeys that doesn't take away from what you are right. but what 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 makes it different is when you accept what you are and say i admit i made a mistake and i'm i'm trying to make a change because right. we are all we all have flaws we sure do yeah we sure do uh, once again i'm just amazed by that story so was it margaret that wanted to get her grandfather's life story in it, front of the world. Margaret wanted, I made a promise to her 18 years ago that I would go out there and pursue to take her story on her father mm-hmm. to the masses. And honestly, it was based on a, a script that Margaret had called a, uh, uh, what was the name of it? It was, um, damn, my mind went blank for a minute. Uh, so, but daughter like, of a gangster. That was the name of it. You know what I'm saying? And um, I had, you know, I had the script, and we just went out and, and tried mm-hmm. to get it done. But the script wasn't a script that was up to par. Okay. You know what I'm saying? No, it wasn't daughter of a gangster. It's called Daddy's Little Girl. That's what it's called, Daddy's okay. Little Girl. I'm sorry okay. about that. And um, I went out there to. I, I made a promise that I was going to go out there and, and make it happen for her. So let's talk about that because you know sometimes I believe in this space. You know, people think that things happen overnight. So let's talk about that process. How long did it take from the thought to it actually happening Man. and getting picked by Epics? And did you have to go through pitches through other um, cable is, networks? I, I'm, I'm going I'm to take it from from A to Z. Okay. It took me 18 years to get this 18 pro- years? 18 years to get this project done. And I was working at BET at the time. Um, I was... Uh, I was on the lower tier of BET, then I started doing, uh, actually, if you remember 106 and Park, I was the individual, after it came from the top top tier, that would put your video on high rotation, medium rotation, low rotation, right? Mm-hmm. And I was doing something I didn't want to do, because I'm a creative person, you know, and I was there just working and working and working, and I'm like, you know, 
but I was also pitching projects and trying to develop projects. I had I had a, a bunch of deals, so this is not my first rodeo that I've been down. And um, I just got tired of like, you know, I was like, you know what? I'm here pitching projects, but I'm not going to be caught up in corporate world, corporate America anymore where I, I get up in the morning, go to work at 9 o'clock, 12.30, I go on a lunch break, mm-hmm. and they're like, Yo, why are you not back at 12.35? Right. And then... <laughs> Sunday morning, you get up and you regret that you got to go to work on Monday. You feel mm-hmm. what I'm saying? That's not living to me. Right. So I, I was still working there and I was pitching projects and pitching projects, you know, and this was a passion piece of mine. You know what I mean? So um, it came to the fact of the matter was uh, 2016, I got let go from BET because of the merger with Viacom. Right. They, already mer- they already merged with Viacom, but they really merged with Viacom and everybody was let go. Mm-hmm. In 16 years, they gave me a four thousand dollars severance. Four thousand, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, no, no, I just got, four thousand dollars. I just got four thousand dollars. Wow. And you know, I had to figure it out. Like, I didn't want to go back to my old ways. Right. I didn't. You know, I was paying my rent with my American Express, and American Express cut me off when they figured it out. And right. I was just like, I got to figure it out. So, an individual by the name of Bernard Alexander, who's like my uncle, he managed uh, the Fuji, the Fugees and uh, 50 Cent and a whole bunch of other people. He knew I had this project and he introduced me to my partner, which is Jim Atchison. Okay. And Jim, I pitched it to him on the phone. He was like, Yeah, I know who Bumpy Johnson is. I'm, I'm a white boy from Boston, but I know who he is. Right. And, you know, after just talking to him about it, he put me on the phone with another agent named Jay Cohen, uh-huh. who's um, over at Gersh. And Jay was like, yeah, we know who Bumpy Johnson is, you know, and this could be a great limited series. I was like, all right, cool. Mm-hmm. Then um, Jim called me back maybe about a week later. He was like, how would you feel about Forrest playing Bumpy Johnson? I said, huh? I hung up the phone. <laughs> called me back again. He said, how would you feel? I said, man, stop playing with me. Right. So he came out here with his wife, mm-hmm. met him, his wife, his, uh, his um, son, Luca, and I brought them to Lennox Terrace to meet Market. Wow. So when they came, to, they, you know, you got... Two Italian folks uh-huh. and their son in Lennox Terrace right. <laughs> talking to Margaret. They was like, oh, right, right. Shit. <laughs> so um, took him to Sylvia's. We had some food. Some soul food from some Sylvia's. Soul food. He yeah. was like, yo, no, let's make this happen. Mm-hmm. And Jim was the pinnacle with me to making this happen because his wife actually manages Forrest Whitaker. Okay. And they became my extended family. They're, they're, they're the best people in the world. And I, we brought it to Forrest, and Forrest, um, fast forward, Forrest didn't commit as an actor. He committed as a producer okay. because he needed the story to be told. It was a great idea, but who's going to write this? Yeah. And after a lot of scripts were submitted to me from CAA, UTA, WME, um, CAA, UTA, WME, um, I was reading spec scripts, and they weren't just the right ones yet. You know, and I just went through IMDb Pro one night and I was looking through my favorite gangster movies and I came across this individual by the name of Chris Brancato and Paul Eckstein. I called, uh, I called Jim. I said, do you know Chris Brancato? He was like, yeah, Chris lives across the street from me. Right. He comes over to my house for Italian, Italian uh, food every Sunday. So he pitched it to Chris. Chris wrote Hoodlum. Okay, one of my favorite. Yeah, so oh. he knew about that space. Uh-huh. And Paul Paul was part of that process as well. And Chris, it took him about an extra six months to get on, but we kept pushing and pushing. And Chris was like, let's go do it. Mm-hmm. And that's how it was done. That's when Forrest later said, you know what, I'm a, I want to play this character. So the network that it landed on, Epics, but did you have to pitch it to other majors? Of course, we got turned down by like three majors. Okay. If it wasn't for Michael Wright over at Epics that believed in our story and said, I don't want to be coy about this. We have money over here and we want to tell this narrative. Right. Because the thing about this, and I'm going to tell your audience, is that, yeah, you can have a great story, but you got to have a story that cuts through the fog. Mm. And on top of that, as a person of color, that's even harder. Right. Because in, Ho- in Hollywood, they don't believe people of color stories sell yeah. great yeah. foreignly. So yeah. domestically, yeah, you could have that all day. But on the foreign side, you know, if you, if you have two partners, if you have a studio and you, you have a network, they have to know what their business model is and what makes sense, you know? Mm-hmm. Even though Black Panther did well, they could still call it an anomaly. Like, you know, right. okay, that was one out of a, yeah. a million shows that did good. Yeah. So it took a, a visionary like Michael Wright, who believed in this, and Nancy Cotton mm-hmm. and Tracy Underwood over at, uh, over at uh, ABC and, uh, 
and Patrick Moran to really come behind us and say, no, this is a dope, dope story. Right, right. This is not, we're not trying to be in power space. We're not trying to be the wire. You know, yes, we're, telling real, we're telling real stories. Yeah. And like you said, how your daughter watched it, I bet you she's on Wikipedia looking up she who did. Adam Clayton Powell is, yeah. who Bumpy Johnson is, who Malcolm X was, because these are all real characters. Right. But I don't call it entertainment. I call it edutainment. Yes. Like we're educating and, and entertaining at the same time. Because she did time. so much research. And yeah. she came back to me and said, Mom, did you know this? And I'm just but, like, wow, but, I didn't even know that. But see, that that shows you because if my my pain and my progression for 18 years was able to spark yeah. someone's mind to actually yeah. go do that, I felt that I did a, I, yeah. I did my job. It even made me get epics. And I didn't even have that yeah. as a cable yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, subscriber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it did what it was supposed to do. Now, we have to wrap up this conversation. Okay, I'm sorry. But will it be renewed for another you'll, season? You'll be hearing an announcement very soon on our very faith. Soon? On our faith. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm, we're in a good space. Yeah. We're in a good space. But one thing I learned in this business to manage your expectations. Mm -hmm. So I, want, I don't want to say yes. Okay. But I could say we're in a good space. Nice, yeah. nice, nice. So what's next for you? Oh, I'm working on a, uh, I have a couple of projects. I'm working with Larima Davis on her father's project, uh, Larry Davis, features on the Bronx. Right. Um, he was supposed to be assassinated by yeah. a bunch of dirty cops in 1989. Yeah. And just he a, just back. a brief story because uh, a part of his, his life, he hid out in um, an apartment in the projects that I grew up in. in wow, Brooklyn. that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, and the police had barricaded the entire... Yeah. Um, can you answer this, please? They barricaded the entire neighborhood. Yeah. Um, a big shootout had ensued, so I'm very familiar with that story. So, yeah, I got the Larry Davis project I'm working on, and I'm in negotiations right now with two uh, two entities. I'm also working on a Suge Knight story with Suge. Really? Yeah, I've been talking to Suge. I'm working with his fiance. Nice. Um I'm working on a project with a guy from Oakland that Obama gave clemency to. His name is Daryl Reed. Nice. I have an am animation I'm working on. Um Maybe with uh, Reverend Run, we're in the talks right now. So yeah, it's I'm in a good space, um, just being being creative. I love it, and in a good space, continuing to be creative with edutainment. Edutainment. And that's what I, you know, I love that word right there. I'm going to continue using it because we're always talking about we don't want to be seen as people of color. Yeah. You know, always just being um, slavery yeah, movies, yeah. which is important. Which is yeah. important, don't get me wrong, but I'm glad that you are just adding sustenance to the genre of our narrative. Thank you so much. For Thank this you for having me. I and, really appreciate uh, it. Yeah, I, you know, I was coming to support you even though I was in traffic and took a $100 Uber out here. <laughs> so oh, you took an Uber? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we got to meet up one day and I'll treat you to dinner. This How does all, that it's sound? It's all great. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank so, you so much. much. Appreciate it. You get back um, with that hundred dollar Uber. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you, you headed back up to Harlem. Yeah, I'm, I'm going back, going to Midtown right now. Yeah. Got you, yeah. got you. Okay. I know BT is having a, a private screening tonight. They're um, uh, airing a, a film at eight o'clock, so I'll be at the forty forty tonight. Oh, with oh really? You. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I might so, shoot through there. Yeah, that'll be it. It starts at um, the Champagne Toast at seven forty five. Yeah. Um, the screening starts at eight. So if okay. you want, just come on by. I definitely. All right. Will. Thanks a lot, Mike Juan. I'll, I'll speak to you text you call you later on okay thank you all right take care okay, bye -bye. so there you have it um let me just watch you walk out you know <laughs> you know that's what we ladies do but i, I definitely love the whole the whole get up I amazing you. Uh, i appreciate you too okay. just amazing story um just joining us um we're gonna have um yo yo really soon in the next couple of minutes just another icon um, in the building, um, just joining this space of Sonia O'Neill. Like I told you, this is the beginning of my seventh year doing this whole celebrity. I don't call them interviews. I want to refer to them as conversations. And I am a, a huge fan, thank you so much, Marquand, of what she does, what she's bringing to the table, Women Empowerment, I know that you've uh, seen her on the most recent episode, um, season of Love and Hip Hop Hollywood, and I love what she added to the genre of reality television. Unfortunately, you know, there's a conversation that resonates among us about reality television just being ratchet television. And I was so happy to see this queen just step into this space as a mentor and not losing who she is because she stepped on the scene in the 90s um, just, you know, in a space where it was just kind of defying 
those sexually explicit language that kind of created uh, women to be very, very sexual and sexually active. And, you know, as a, a teen told me the other day, she asked me, you know, how often did you bust it open when you were in high school? And I was just like, what? So that music that Yo-Yo gave us in the 90s and her most recent song, Out of Control, I'm glad that she stayed true to herself. And without any further ado, we have Yo-Yo on the phone. Yo-Yo, how are you? Hello, how are you? How are you? Oh my gosh, you have no idea how I am smiling from ear to ear right now. Thank you for blessing this space. Well, happy Saturday. Thank you for having me. Oh, no problem. You know, we're just going to get right into this conversation because my listeners, since I posted that you were going to be joining this show, they have been waiting and holding their breaths. Now, I remember when you stepped on the scene in 1990 on Ice Cube's America's Most Wanted. And then yeah. after that, you released albums that promoted female empowerment that denounced sexism and hip hop music when gangster rap was at an all time high. You were still a teenager. What made you want to create music that kind of defied what was being promoted on the West Coast and unfortunately on the East Coast as well? What made you want to do that? When I first came out, um, I'd already been rapping. I've been rapping since I was in junior high school. So it was like the 86, 86. And, you know, I was just a fan of, I was a fan of entertainment. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to just be a black girl on television. You know, just watching television and wanting to see myself. Mm -hmm. So before I wanted to do music, I just wanted to be a black girl scene. And so when hip hop came out, it was something that, you know, I, I worked myself to do. I, I never thought I'd be famous doing it. Wow. So you just did it for the love of music and not for the love I, of money. I did it. I, I did it for the, I did it for the voice of women. Mm. I mean, you know, Ice Cube and WA, it was a lot of songs, a bitch is a bitch. Mm. I ain't the one more so of just a girl want the guy's money, you know, a girl used as a sex object. And so my, my lyrics are always, you know, who you call it a bitch type right. of rap. Yeah, you know? yeah. You know, I know that we received it here on the East Coast, you know, me growing up um, in the 90s. My friends and I, we danced to it, we vibed to it. Was the music industry as receptive to it, even though the people were? Was it, I'm sorry? Was the music industry... The, the, the record executives, were they receptive to your type of music that empowered women, even though we did it as consumers? You, you know, um, I mean, I had a I had a great reception mm. being brought on by Ice Cube, who had made such a, a wave in the music industry. I mean, people really paid attention to me when I came on the scene. Yeah. I mean, you know, with. with with the help of Ice Cube. Yeah. Um, and because he respected me so much, the music that we put out together had such a Bonnie and Clyde type of environment. Yeah. You know, um, it, it just made people take a listen. And that's all, you know, I, when I first started, let me just be clear. Okay. I had no idea what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that my voice even made a difference. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that I was speaking for so many women. Um, um, I later learned the, who I was, and, and that's how my journey began yeah. when I realized who I was. Well, you helped a lot of women. I know for me, um, as a young girl hey. back then, you helped me kind of hey. define who I was at that time. And just growing up in New York City around that era where it was defined by sex, drugs, money, and violence, you know, I'm going to be real about it. We kind of looked at the drug dealers, you know, as the epitome of what a man should be. And when your music came out, your music, um, Queen Latifah, Salt and Pepper, it gave me a different optics to say, you know what, there's a life outside of, you know, what the men are telling girls that they should be. So talking about, you know, Queen Latifah and Salt and Pepper, who in the music industry, female rappers became your friends? Well, of course, I, I looked up to Queen Latifah, Salt and Pepper. I, I looked up to Sequence. I mean, I mean, I looked up to... Um, Tina Marie. Yeah. I, I looked up to just artists. I mean, I, I looked up to Run DMC, mm -hmm. uh, LL Cool J. Um, you know, even though Cameo is not a big thing of hip hop, you know, I, I even loved, um, you know, Word Up. You know, yeah. it was almost <laughs> like, you know, he was rapping those lyrics. I mean, I, I loved Cameo. 
Um, I just love the music. You know, I grew up in a musical family. My, my house was always the party house. Mama there with the spicy meatballs. Who's my mom? You know. <laughs> Your mother needs her own show, party. by the way. I, I've hey. seen her on, on Instagram. Your mother hey. has a personality <laughs> when I tell you. <laughs> imagine, imagine, gro- imagine growing up in that house. Oh, my gosh. Was all night and get cussed out in the morning. To come and watch Sounds dances. like my mother. So that's how I can relate. <laughs> For real. Get up and come wash these damn dishes. Yes, that was the house. I, 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 you know, and I would get up in the morning like I didn't make none of these damn dishes. Right, um, but, um, but that's the kind of you know environment I grew up in. I think you know a lot of my, the women who inspired me, who later became my friends, was um, you know Queen Latifah. We weren't as close as MC Light and I are, okay. um, but you know we grew up together, so we became sisters. I mean, we hung out. I knew their mother. I knew Queen Latifah's brother before he passed away. Mm-hmm. You know, we would be at each other's houses. I mean, you know, it was just that type of thing. When MC, when when Missy Elliott came out, she was the first artist who ever embraced me as mm. um, someone who have paved the way for women. Mm. You know, and I always like to give credit to Missy Elliott because she was so humble. She came to my video shoot. She brought flowers. Nice. brought me this beautiful plant-based, I mean, this vase mm-hmm. that I kept for so long. Um, you know, she was just the one who came over to my house. She bought my kids gifts. You know, she wanted to be a part, and I love her for that. Um, so, you know, just women in the industry. I mean, I'm now great friends with Foxy Brown. Nice. You know, um, I'm great friends with a lot of MCs. You mm-hmm. know, me, me, you, Fresh, um, Rhapsody. You know, there's a lot of women, you know, who hasn't made a name for themselves yeah, that I've yeah. connected myself with. And only because I knew that's what I needed. I just needed some connection. Right. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't competing against you. That because I'm fast and I'm wild and, you know, and I might shake my ass, you know, crazy or I might say some wild shit doesn't mean that, mm-hmm. you know, um, that I'm, it's against you. Right. Or, you know, so the, the fact that we can start, start getting women just to recognize each other without dissing each other was yeah. a big thing for me. Yeah. You know, because every time I would do an interview, it was always the women they would challenge me against. So what do you think about so-and-so? Right. And what do you think about so-and-so? Which women, one woman in hip-hop don't you like? Mm. And, you know, and it was almost like, ask me about some dudes. You right. know, like, which dudes I don't like yeah, in hip-hop? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to keep going against women. I don't want to keep competing against women. It's and, not enough of us out here to compete against each other. Yeah, there's enough, you know, uh, seats at the table, enough food on the table for everybody to eat. And you don't only just talk about it. You're definitely about that life. And we saw that the seasons of Love and Hip Hop Hollywood, where you aligned yourself with some emerging um, female artists and also a male artist on your latest single, Out of Control. What made you once yes. again, and I know that you, you've kind of alluded to it, you know, you just want to give others an opportunity because, you know, somebody gave you an opportunity. But what type of response did you receive when you released Out of Control, um, knowing that you had emerging artists on the track as well? You know, it, it was all love. It was Good. a lot of fear going into it because, uh-huh. you know, I really... I mean, you know, because I've learned so much and that's the only thing about learning so much You kind of, you can get like caught up in, in all of this, you know, you can get caught up in it. You can get caught up in, ah, I don't want to do that. Maybe I'm too big for that. Or maybe I'm too grown for that. Maybe I shouldn't do, you know, you can get caught up in a lot of those different things. Uh, But I think the work that I've been doing in the schools and working with kids and in my community it, it, you know, when, people, when you hear people talk about coming full circle, mm-hmm. I think me coming full circle, and the only way I could have come full circle was through the ke- through the youth, through the kids. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? There was no way I can touch new ground unless I stepped on it. Mm. Um, and that's the same thing of me being in love and hip hop. People say, "Why would you do love and hip hop?" Right. I mean, that's the only way I can touch new ground. True. I mean, you know, and 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 I'm and we when I came out, people hated hip hop. They was like, "Ah, oh, you know, what is this?" music what is this what is this how long is he here to stay do you feel you're responsible that's how i feel now when people ask me why would i do love and hip-hop it's like Hmm. shit it's hip-hop right it's hip-hop and hip-hop definitely defines a culture and 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 it's not going anywhere and we have to stay connected to everybody you know what i mean i mean you know it's the connect gang bing bing bang you got to stay connected. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 
so true. So true. Now, let's just kind of, you know, rewind a little bit because we're talking about the current state of hip hop, you know, the past state of hip hop. You know, I believe it was in 1994 when you testified again, you know, in front of the Judiciary Committee because they wanted yeah. to put in front of Congress. Yeah, yeah, they wanted to put labels on rap music. Yeah. Now, talking yeah. about back then and connecting it to today's music, if that conversation still surfaced, would you still be on the same side and still have the same opinion that this uh, current state of rap music should not have labels on it or ratings? Yeah, we need labels on this shit. I'm <laughs> I feel you. I feel you on that one. Yeah, you know, you, you, you know, know when you know better, you do better. Yeah. You know, for me, this new generation is just, you know. It's too much. much. You know, we got a lot of talented artists. But remember, a, a lot of 80s babies was crack babies. Yes. Yes. You know, you got a lot of kids growing up with no mamas. You know, nowadays the mamas are the kids. Right. You know, you hear a lot of kids saying they're taking care of their mamas. I mean, yeah. you're supposed to do that when your mama's like 70, 80 and retired. Right. But, you know, in the black community, it's a lot different because you have so many young kids, that, you know, that yeah. they, you know, their mama was a part of their drug game, crack True. game. True. And um, I've, you I've, know what I mean? I even found like back then, you know, the lyrics you know, we were selling drugs back then. Nowadays, well, you know what? You, they're you, using. It, it, well, you know what? No, what? it's just, if nothing is controlled, it's out of control. Yeah. Shout out to your new you know, song. You know, when, when nothing is controlled, you've got to have, you, you know, even, you know, the, the older I grow, I, I, I realize certain things, you know, you know, I, I gave my kids way too much space than I should have given them. I should have beat their ass a long time ago and set more boundaries. <laughs> Me too, girl. Don't feel bad about that. One. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to beat my daughter ass this morning. Her mouth got a little bit too slick. <laughs> and she's 24. I should have set way more boundaries, but I thought the boundaries that my mother set was way too strict. Right. And here I go stretching the boundaries. Right. You know what I mean? And then they took all of this stuff out of school, religion, mm -hmm. and you know what I mean? You and can't even say Merry Christmas in school anymore. They're like, oh, that's too religious they right now. Say happy holidays. Yes. Yes. Crazy. It's crazy. But, you know, with this whole yeah. current space of hip hop and a lot of young artists dying, you know, we just had Juice World yeah. die, you know, last week. Rest in peace to him. Um, have you ever been in a space growing up through the culture of hip hop where you either use drugs and had to get off of it or been pressured to use drugs? No, no. When I grew up, all my homeboys were dying. Mm. Yeah, my whole community was dying. It was a gang war here in Los Angeles in the community that I grew up in. Everybody that I grew up in was dying. I mean, I, I don't have any homeboys that I grew up with. Oh, wow. And, you know, they're all buried or serving life in prison. Mm. Um, so that was the lesson so, that you, you know, needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, um, it, 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 it's, it's different, but it's the same. It's just a different type of same. Right. You yeah. know, if that makes sense. It's yeah. a different kind of same. You know, where you just have to be involved, you know, mm -hmm. it's the same thing that they need. They needed love then. They needed attention then. They needed somebody to shine a light on them and help them. They needed some conversation. They needed some testimonies and some some history. Mm -hmm. And they, they didn't get it because when people make it, they're so afraid to tell their story story mm -hmm. they want to sell their story mm. and, and and it doesn't help our community because you make it out of your community you fucking president right so true you 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 the bit you bigger than a doctor in the community you right. make it out of your hood you gotta come back and that's the big thing that i'm realizing that people so afraid like people say oh yo yo you know what's up with california oh pe they say people from california are fake well everybody who come here is fake because they're not from here mm. you know they come <laughs> here and they recreate themselves mm. and they're not even you know they're doing no justice or, or service to their community because they're not even in their community mm -hmm. they're not even nowhere around it they're in california you know, being as Hollywood stars, and that's just not what black culture was made of. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. And it, and it won't be made of that at any point in time. You know, but let's just talk about your new single, um, Out of Control. I love hey, it. Hey. Out of control. Let me tell you something. Even, you know, when, when I came into the studio today, I played it again. It was my daughter's first time 
hearing that song, but this is the purpose of Sonia on there. I want to connect the big OGs to little OGs. I think that the conversation is very, very important. Now, what made you re-emerge with new music? You know, for most people who don't know, they think that you disappeared somewhere. You were acting, you know, here and there throughout the years. But what made you re-emerge in 2019 with new music? I know. Go, yo, 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 I know, girl, fearless. I was, you know, it, I'm so excited about this project because, uh-huh. first of all, it just, it took me out of my comfort zone because, you know, you get so caught up in politics, mm-hmm. you get so caught up into community, yeah. you know, you have, you create this, um, this, mold for yourself you know so to step out of that mold and to just be free to Mm -hmm. you know spit do whatever you want to do whatever you know that's it's a lot you know it's a lot of um bipolarness in there (laughs) girl please it's a lot of you know what i mean mean? like i gotta i want to be i want to be free i want to be me but then i have these guidelines that i have set up for myself so it's like um but but out of control it was easy. I went to the studio working with some other artists, some young artists, and, you know, them playing a the song. And I was like, I, I like that track. I was like, can I get that one? Yeah. He's like, yeah. Picasso was like, yeah. I came home. I wrote to it. I was like, let's go to the studio and do it. He's like, all right, let's go. Wow. Went to the studio and did it. Next thing I know, I'm like, I want to put it out. Mm. And, that, and that was just energy. I, I think, you know, how they say a, a, a fish swims upstream. Right. That I was just in the right stream. Gotcha. Flowing. Gotcha. You know what I mean? And I didn't stop myself. I didn't lo- allow my circle, you know, I didn't allow nothing to stop me. And yeah. the kids love it. You know, I sing it. And I'm, I'm proud of it. They call me every day. People, somebody's calling me every day with the song, <laughs> video, FaceTiming me. You know, I like what I like what I like. Okay. You know, Don't make me pull up on that, the grass know. at your mama's What's house. Your about? That's my favorite line. <laughs> hey, hey, and you know, and people say, yo, yo, damn near 50, talking about pulling up at somebody. Well, I'm not 50, and I'm not even close to 50, but I've been doing it so long that I get it. Right. But, you know, pulling up on somebody's mama house, that's, I mean, at the grass at your mama house can be any age. It sure can. It sure yeah, can. Play with a woman and see what happens. Okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, she in the- up at your homeboy's house. Play right. With woman. I don't care how old she is. Don't try to play her out. Hey, it has no limit for women. No limit hey, at all. Hey, don't try to play yourself. Don't try to play yourself. So, with this new music, let's say if record labels approached you and they wanted to sign you, would you sign to a major label or do you think that you would continue to go the route of independently? Yeah, no, I'm just going to go independent for the rest of this round, honey. I didn't have my money played with long enough. I got you. I got you on that one. I'm finding yeah, a lot of artists. Yeah, my money long enough. I'm going to take what I get and go on with it. And that's what they're learning from the big OGs, you know, the, the little OGs nowadays. They're learning from your mistakes, and they're learning how to do it better, and they're securing the bag what, on what, their own what, terms. We're learning how to do it. Well, we're learning how to do it. We didn't even know how to do it. Yeah, because I, I, I heard some place where you blew, uh, what was it, $800,000? Listen, I, I don't know how much money I've blown, mm-hmm. um, but I, I, I mean, you know, I've done, I've, I, I've never really blown any money. Any money I've had, I've made it work for me, and that's how gotcha. I've been successful my whole life. Gotcha. I've never done uh, extraordinary things mm-hmm. with my cash. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've bought houses, I've bought properties, I've invested. I mean, I, I really haven't screwed my money over. You know what I mean? I've loaned some people some money that I shouldn't have. But right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That I need some fucking return. On. But, <laughs> but I've never, I've never, I've never, I've never been um, frugal. I mean, uh, you know, um, what do you call that? Foul with my money. Gotcha. I've, I've never, I've never had enough to play with. You know what I mean? Like th- this new generation of money is something we've never seen. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's so and, true. And, and I don't know if it's all cash flow or if it's, you know, like this young boy who passed away with all those drugs. I'm saying you would never have ca- caught me with drugs like that. I know. That was, you know, that was, that was a good decision. I don't know if they have side, gig, side gigs or what the hell is going on. Right. But we didn't have it like that. And when we did get, we, we wasn't putting it back in the hood, making bricks out of it and, 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 and taking over our community. So true. So true. So if you could give an emerging rapper one piece of advice, something that you've learned from the start of your career up until this current day, what would be that one piece of advice? Don't fuck up your money. Don't hmm. blow your bag. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is you've got to live within your truth. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, 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 we've seen, what I can tell them is 
we've seen so many people blow through their money. You've watched Mike Tyson. I mean, you've watched MC Hammer. You've yeah. watched so many people blow through their money that don't be stupid. Mm-hmm. Don't be stupid. It don't last forever. You've got to do great things with your money. Don't True. be stupid. And you know, you know what I mean? It, buy, it, you know, it, you can buy... Well, Buying your whole mama and everybody a house, that's good. But can they yeah. keep it 10 years from now? So true. So true. And I, I well, can understand. Will the revenue still flow 10 years from now? Because it's easy to put them in the house. But can, can they maintain it? Right. Can they stay there? You know? Can they stay there? Yeah. And, you know, I think so that there, there should be some more financial literacy courses in school and especially Without a part what? of when you're signing these major record labels because we come from communities where we've never seen money like that in our lives and when we get it I can Without understand question. how easy it is to get caught up but once again when I'm talking to big OGs like you I want to make sure that you're imparting those life lessons amongst these little OGs that they they know you know okay they yeah, made those think, mistakes we're not going to do that I just seen Cardi B give her her her, her baby daddy Five hundred thousand dollars, cold, wow. cold cash. They said, really, cold cash, five hundred thousand dollars in a refrigerator. I, I just don't ever want to see her broke. Yeah, me either. You know that that maybe maybe he got good dick. I don't know because I ain't giving no five hundred. Girl, you got her five hundred thousand. I'm damn. I don't. That even must be some five, good. I don't want to give a nigga five thousand. <laughs> Okay, maybe a bus pass with that. No, yeah, I don't know. He better have his own I car. Wanted, I, I gave up fifty before, but I don't know about five hundred thousand. <laughs> that's a lie. But do you know that's what happens? New to the industry because you're fresh from the hood and you're still learning how to manage your money. So we just gonna play, uh, pray over Cardi B to make sure that she doesn't do that ever, 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 ever again. But you know, hey, we, hey. you know what? Listen, you know, she. Hopefully, it go. It's a, it's a cycle, you know. And, yeah. and I, I love Cardi. You know, I, yeah. I love Cardi. I love Cardi B. I love who she is. I've yes. always loved her. I love her personality. Yes. You know, I can't wait to hang out with her um, as a little sister because I just love who she is. Right. Um, but, you know, I just think that we all make young, young, rational decisions that right. if we had to look back on it and think about it. We but we, like you said, we don't talk money. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's in the black community. It's like, listen, you know, you fake it till you make it. Right. You pretend like you have it. Um you know, the best thing that I, I could say is being real with myself. I mean, I think that not until I started being real with myself did I ever really start growing. Mm. Like, I've had great things my entire career. My kids have lived a great life their whole careers. But I tell that to my daughter. Like, I used to think she was so high mm-hmm. that, it, I mean, you know, on a scale because of how I've placed her, that I thought that once I released myself from her, she was going to fall like mm. a bird from the sky. You know what I mean? And I was thinking like, damn, how can I level her out? Right. <laughs> well, when you find the, you know? the answer to that, let me know. <laughs> because, you know... <laughs> I'm the same type of mother, most definitely. (gasps) You know, we have to wrap up this conversation, but I need, you know, I'm going to ask you a huge favor, Yo-Yo, because there's one thing that you've done throughout your career that resonates with me and uh, a mother-daughter opportunity. My daughter, she just walked into the room and she's going to be able to experience it. She's smiling at me right now. Your appearance on Martin as Kilolo. I mean, that hey. is like classic right there, especially when they did the um, the talent show and yeah. <laughs> you and Shanene. Can you recite some of those lyrics for me, please? Can I ask you that? Don't nobody know me like my homies to open up that phony. Shanene ain't halfway phony. Don't be trying to trick if you ain't rich. Shanene ain't no trick. You better have a, a girl. <laughs> if you ain't got no rims on your hoopty, don't, don't be trying, trying to pull me. me. <laughs> God, just let a sister be. You, you want some, some, but you can't get none. Uh uh, don't be bad. Hey, you want some? Tell your daughter I said hello. Oh, she heard you when she says hello Hi, back. Hi, daughter. Be great. Be great. Be great. Thank you for pouring that into her spirit. You know, I'm I'm always surrounding my daughter around people who can just make her soar even higher. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your intellectual capital. Thank you for your amazing energy. And I wish you nothing but continued blessings, my queen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Peace. So there you have it. Two amazing 
conversations, because like I said, I don't like to call them interviews at all, for the new season of Sonya On Air, make sure that you subscribe to all of my streaming platforms on Spotify, on iTunes, on iHeartRadio, on Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts, and on YouTube. Make sure that you also follow me on Instagram, Sonya On Air. We will be back next week with another dope conversation. I love you so much for just carving out time and allowing me to give you some positive energy, some life lessons, and some love. Thank you so much. This is Sonya on air.